This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the North American Review of May 8, 1807. Chapters from My Autobiography. Chapter 17 by Mark Twain. From Susie's Biography of Me. September 9, 1885. Mama is teaching Jean a little natural history and is making a little collection of insects for her. But Mama does not allow Jean to kill any insects. She only collects those insects that are found dead. Mama has told us all, particularly Jean, to bring her all the little dead insects that she finds. The other day, as we were all sitting at supper, Jean broke into the room and ran triumphantly up to Mama and presented her with a plate full of dead flies. Mama thanked Jean very enthusiastically, although she, with difficulty, concealed her amusement. Just then Sour Mash entered the room, and Jean, believing her hungry, asked Mama for permission to give her the flies. Mama laughingly consented, and the flies almost immediately disappeared. Monday, October 15, 1906. Sour Mash's presence indicates that this adventure occurred at Quarry Farm. Susie's biography interests itself pretty exclusively with historical facts. Where they happen is not a matter of much concern to her. When other historians refer to the Bunker Hill Monument, they know it is not necessary to mention that that monument is in Boston. Susie recognizes that when she mentions Sour Mash, it is not necessary to localize her. To Susie, Sour Mash is the Bunker Hill Monument of Quarry Farm. Ordinary cats have some partiality for living flies, but none for dead ones. But Susie does not trouble herself to apologize for Sour Mash's eccentricities of taste. This biography was for us, and Susie knew that nothing that Sour Mash might do could startle us or need explanation, we being aware that she was not an ordinary cat, but moving upon a plane far above the prejudices and superstitions which are law to common catdom. Once in Hartford the flies were so numerous for a time, and so troublesome, that Mrs. Clemens conceived the idea of paying George note, the colored butler, a bounty on all the flies he might kill. The children saw an opportunity here for the acquisition of sudden wealth. They supposed that their mother merely wanted to accumulate dead flies for some aesthetic or scientific reason or other, and they judged that the more flies she could get, the happier she would be. So they went into business with George on a commission. Straightway the dead flies began to arrive in such quantities that Mrs. Clemens was pleased beyond words with the success of her idea. Next she was astonished that one house could furnish so many. She was paying an extravagantly high bounty, and it presently began to look as if by this addition to our expenses we were now probably living beyond our income. After a few days there was peace and comfort. Not a fly was discoverable in the house. There wasn't a straggler left. Still, to Mrs. Clemens' surprise, the dead flies continued to arrive by the plateful, and the bounty expense was as crushing as ever. Then she made inquiry, and found that our innocent little rascals had established a fly trust, and had hired all the children in the neighborhood to collect flies on a cheap and unburdensome commission. Mrs. Clemens's experience in this matter was a new one for her, but the governments of the world had tried it, and wept over it, and discarded it, every half-century since man was created. Any government could have told her that the best way to increase wolves in America, rabbits in Australia, and snakes in India, is to pay a bounty on their scalps. Then every patriot goes to raising them. From Susie's Biography of Me, September 10, 1885 The other evening Clara and I brought down our new soap-bubble water, and we all blew soap-bubbles. Papa blew his soap-bubbles and filled them with tobacco smoke, and as the light shone on them they took very beautiful opaline colors. Papa would hold them, and then let us catch them in our hand, and they felt delightful to the touch. The mixture of the smoke and water had a singularly pleasant effect. It is human life. We are blown upon the world. 
we float buoyantly upon the summer air a little while, complacently showing off our grace of form and our dainty iridescent colors. Then we vanish, with a little puff, leaving nothing behind but a memory, and sometimes not even that. I suppose that at those solemn times when we wake in the deeps of the night and reflect, there is not one of us who is not willing to confess that he is really only a soap-bubble, and as little worth the making. I remember those days of twenty-one years ago, and a certain pathos clings about them. Susie, with her manifold young charms and her iridescent mind, was as lovely a bubble as any we made that day, and as transitory. She passed, as they passed, in her youth and beauty, and nothing of her is left but a heartbreak and a memory. That long-vanished day came vividly back to me a few weeks ago, when, for the first time in twenty-one years, I found myself again amusing a child with smoke-charged soap-bubbles. Susie's next date is November twenty ninth, 1885, the eve of my fiftieth birthday. It seems a good while ago. I must have been rather young for my age then, for I was trying to tame an old-fashioned bicycle nine feet high. It is to me almost unbelievable, at my present stage of life, that there have really been people willing to trust themselves upon a dizzy and unstable altitude like that, and that I was one of them. Twitchell and I took lessons every day. He succeeded, and became a master of the art of riding that wild vehicle. But I had no gift in that direction, and was never able to stay on mine long enough to get any satisfactory view of the planet. Every time I tried to steal a look at a pretty girl or any other kind of scenery, that single moment of inattention gave the bicycle the chance it had been waiting for, and I went over the front of it and struck the ground on my head or my back before I had time to realize that something was happening. I didn't always go over the front way. I had other ways, and practiced them all. But no matter which way was chosen for me, there was always one monotonous result. The bicycle skinned my leg and leapt up into the air and came down on top of me. Sometimes its wires were so sprung by this violent performance that it had the collapsed look of an umbrella that it had a misunderstanding with a cyclone. After each day's practice I arrived at home with my skin hanging in ribbons from my knees down. I plastered the ribbons on where they belonged, and bound them there with handkerchiefs steeped in ponds extract and was ready for more adventures next day. It was always a surprise to me that I had so much skin, and that it held out so well. There was always plenty, and I soon came to understand that the supply was going to remain sufficient for all my needs. It turned out that I had nine skins, in layers, one on top of the other, like the leaves of a book, and some of the doctors said it was quite remarkable. I was full of enthusiasm over this insane amusement. My teacher was a young German from the bicycle factory, a gentle, kindly, patient creature, with a pathetically grave face. He never smiled, he never made a remark, he always gathered me tenderly up when I plunged off, and helped me on again without a word. When he had been teaching me twice a day for three weeks, I introduced a new gymnastic, one that he had never seen before, and so at least a compliment was wrung from him a thing which I had been risking my life for days to achieve. He gathered me up and said mournfully, "'Mr. Clemens, you can fall off a bicycle in more different ways than any person I ever saw before.' A boy's life is not all comedy. Much of the tragic enters into it. The drunken tramp, mentioned in Tom Sawyer, or Huck Finn, who was burned up in the village jail, lay upon my conscience a hundred nights afterward, and filled them with hideous dreams, dreams in which I saw his appealing face as I had seen it in the pathetic reality, pressed against the window-bars, with the red hell glowing behind him, a face which seemed to say to me, If you had not given me the matches this would not have happened. You are responsible for my death. I was not responsible for it for I had meant him no harm, but only good when I let him have the matches. But no matter, mine was a trained Presbyterian conscience, and knew but the one duty, 
to hunt and harry its slave upon all pretexts and all occasions, particularly when there was no sense or reason in it. The tramp, who was to blame, suffered ten minutes. I, who was not to blame, suffered three months. The shooting down of poor old Smar in the main street, see Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, at noonday supplied me with some more dreams, and in them I always saw again the grotesque closing picture, the great family Bible spread open on the profane old man's breast, by some thoughtful idiot, and rising and sinking to the labored breathings, and adding the torture of its leaden weight to the dying struggles. We are curiously made. In all the throng of gaping and sympathetic onlookers, there was not one with common sense enough to perceive that an anvil would have been in better taste there than the Bible, less open to sarcastic criticism, and swifter in its atrocious work. In my nightmares I gasped and struggled for breath under the crush of that vast book for many a night. All within the space of a couple of years we had two or three other tragedies, and I had the ill luck to be too near by on each occasion. There was a slave-man who was struck down with a chunk of slag for some small offence. I saw him die. And the young California immigrant who was stabbed with a bowie-knife by a drunken comrade. I saw the red life gush from his breast. And the case of the rowdy young Hyde brothers and their harmless old uncle. One of them held the old man down with his knees on his breast, while the other one tried repeatedly to kill him with an Allen revolver which wouldn't go off. I happened along just then, of course. Then there was the case of the young California immigrant who got drunk and proposed to raid the Welshman's house, all alone one dark and threatening night, used in Huck Finn, I think. This house stood halfway up Holliday's Hill, Cardiff Hill, and its sole occupants were a poor but quite respectable widow and her young and blameless daughter. The invading ruffian woke the whole village with his ribald yells and coarse challenges and obscenities. I went up there with a comrade, John Briggs, I think, to look and listen. The figure of the man was dimly visible. The women were on their porch, but not visible in the deep shadow of its roof. But we heard the elder woman's voice. She had loaded an old musket with slugs, and she warned the man that if he stayed where he was while she counted ten, it would cost him his life. She began to count slowly. He began to laugh. He stopped laughing at six. Then through the deep stillness in a steady voice followed the rest of the tale. Seven, eight, nine, a long pause, we holding our breath, ten, a red spout of flame gushed out into the night, and the man dropped with his breast riddled to rags. Then the rain and the thunder burst loose, and the waiting town swarmed up the hill in the glare of the lightning like an invasion of ants. Those people saw the rest. I had had my share, and was satisfied. I went home to dream, and was not disappointed. My teaching and training enabled me to see deeper into these tragedies than an ignorant person could have done. I knew what they were for. I tried to disguise it from myself, but down in the secret deeps of my heart I knew, and I knew that I knew. They were inventions of providence to beguile me to a better life. It sounds curiously innocent and conceited now, but to me there was nothing strange about it. It was quite in accordance with the thoughtful and judicious ways of providence as I understood them. It would not have surprised me, nor even overflattered me, if Providence had killed off that whole community in trying to save an asset like me. Educated as I had been, it would have seemed just the thing, and well worth the expense. Why Providence should take such an anxious interest in such a property, that idea never entered my head, and there was no one in that simple hamlet who would have dreamed of putting it there. For one thing, no one was equipped with it. It is quite true I took all the tragedies to myself, and tallied them off in turn as they happened, saying to myself in each case with a sigh, Another one gone, and on my account this ought to bring me to repentance. His patience will not always endure. And yet, privately, I believed it would. That is, I believed it in the daytime, but not in the night. With the going down of the sun, my faith failed, 
and the clammy fears gathered about my heart, and it was then that I repented. Those were awful nights, nights of despair, nights charged with the bitterness of death. After each tragedy I recognized the warning and repented, repented and begged, begged like a coward, begged like a dog, and not in the interest of those poor people who had been extinguished for my sake, but only in my own interest. It seems selfish when I look back on it now. My repentances were very real, very earnest, and after each tragedy they happened every night for a long time. But as a rule they could not stand the daylight. They faded out and shredded away, and disappeared in the glad splendor of the sun. They were the creatures of fear and darkness, and they could not live out of their own place. The day gave me cheer and peace, and at night I repented again. In all my boyhood life I am not sure that I ever tried to lead a better life in the daytime, or wanted to. In my age I should never think of wishing to do such a thing. But in my age, as in my youth, night brings me many a deep remorse. I realize that from the cradle up I have been like the rest of the race, never quite sane in the night. When Indian Joe died, used in Tom Sawyer, but never mind. In another chapter I have already described what a raging hell of repentance I passed through then. I believe that for months I was as pure as the driven snow after dark. It was back in those far distant days, 1848 or 9, that Jim Wolfe came to us. He was from Shelbyville, a hamlet thirty or forty miles back in the country, and he brought all his native sweetnesses and gentlenesses and simplicities with him. He was approaching seventeen, a grave and slender lad, trustful, honest, a creature to love and cling to, and he was incredibly bashful. It is to this kind that untoward things happen. My sister gave a candy-pull on a winter's night. I was too young to be of the company, and Jim was too diffident. I was sent up to bed early, and Jim followed of his own motion. His room was in the new part of the house and his window looked out on the roof of the L annex. That roof was six inches deep in snow, and the snow had an ice-crust upon it which was as slick as glass. Out of the comb of the roof projected a short chimney, a common resort for sentimental cats on moonlight nights, and this was a moonlight night. Down at the eaves below the chimney a canopy of dead vines spread away to some posts, making a cosy shelter, and after an hour or two the rollicking crowd of young ladies and gentlemen grouped themselves in its shade, with their saucers of liquid and piping-hot candy disposed about them on the frozen ground to cool. There was joyous chafing and joking and laughter, peal upon peal of it. About this time a couple of old disreputable tomcats got up on the chimney and started a heated argument about something. Also about this time I gave up trying to get to sleep, and went visiting to Jim's room. He was awake and fuming about the cats and their intolerable yowling. I asked him mockingly why he didn't climb out and drive them away. He was nettled, and said over boldly that for two cents he would. It was a rash remark, and was probably repented of before it was fairly out of his mouth, but it was too late. He was committed. I knew him, and I knew he would rather break his neck than back down if I egged him on judiciously. Oh, of course you would. Who's doubting it? It galled him, and he burst out with sharp irritation. Maybe you doubt it. I? Oh, no, I shouldn't think of such a thing. You are always doing wonderful things with your mouth. He was in a passion now. He snatched on his yarn socks and began to raise the window, saying in a voice unsteady with anger, you think I doesn't. You do. Think what you blame, please. I don't care what you think. I'll show you." The window made him rage. It wouldn't stay up. I said, Never mind. I'll hold it. Indeed, I would have done anything to help. I was only a boy, and was already in a radiant heaven of anticipation. He climbed carefully out, clung to the window-sill until his feet were safely placed, then began to pick his perilous way on all fours along the glassy comb a foot and a hand on each side of it. I believe I enjoy it now as much as I did then, yet it is a good deal over fifty years ago. 
the frosty breeze flapped his short shirt about his lean legs the crystal roof shone like polished marble in the intense glory of the moon the unconscious cat sat erect upon the chimney alertly watching each other lashing their tails and pouring out their hollow grievances and slowly and cautiously jim crept on flapping as he went the gay and frolicsome young creatures under the vine canopy unaware and outraging these solemnities with their misplaced laughter every time jim slipped i had a hope but always on he crept and disappointed it at last he was within reaching distance he paused raised himself carefully up measured his distance deliberately then made a frantic grab at the nearest cat and missed of course he lost his balance his heels flew up he struck on his back and like a rocket he darted down the roof feet first crashed through the dead vines and landed in a sitting posture in fourteen saucers of red-hot candy in the midst of all that party and dressed as he was this lad who could not look a girl in the face with his clothes on there was a wild scramble and a storm of shrieks and jim fled up the stairs dripping broken crockery all the way the incident was ended but i was not done with yet though i supposed i was eighteen or twenty years later i arrived in new york from california and by that time i had failed in all my other undertakings and had stumbled into literature without intending it this was early in eighteen sixty seven i was offered a large sum to write something for the sunday mercury and i answered with the tale of jim wolf and the cats i also collected the money for it twenty-five dollars it seemed overpay but i did not say anything about that for I was not so scrupulous then as I am now. A year or two later Jim Wolf and the Cats appeared in a Tennessee paper in a new dress, as to spelling, spelling borrowed from Artemus Ward. The appropriator of the tale had a wide reputation in the West, and was exceedingly popular. Deservedly so, I think. He wrote some of the breeziest and funniest things I have ever read, and did his work with distinguished ease and fluency. His name has passed out of my memory a couple of years went by then the original story my own version cropped up again and went floating around in the original spelling and with my name to it soon first one paper and then another fell upon me vigorously for stealing jim wolf and the cats from the tennessee man i got a merciless beating but i did not mind it it's all in the game besides i had learned a good while before that that it is not wise to keep the fire going under a slander unless you can get some large advantage out of keeping it alive few slanders can stand the wear of silence but i was not done with jim and the cats yet in eighteen seventy three i was lecturing in london in the queen's concert rooms hanover square and was living at the langham hotel portland place i had no domestic household and no official household except george dolby lecture agent and charles warren stoddart the california poet now nineteen hundred professor of english literature in the roman catholic university washington ostensibly stoddart was my private secretary in reality he was merely my comrade i hired him in order to have his company as secretary there was nothing for him to do except to scrapbook the daily reports of the great trial of the tichborne claimant for perjury but he made a sufficient job of that for the reports filled six columns a day and he usually postponed the scrapbooking until sunday then he had thirty-six columns to cut out and paste in a proper labor for hercules he did his work well but if he had been older and feebler it would have killed him once a week without doubt he does his literary lectures well but also without doubt he prepares them fifteen minutes before he is due on his platform and thus gets into them a freshness and sparkle which they might lack if they underwent the staling process of overstudy he was good company when he was awake he was refined sensitive charming gentle generous honest himself and unsuspicious of other people's honesty and i think he was the purest male i have known in mind and speech george dolby was something of a contrast to him but the two were very friendly and sociable together nevertheless dolby was large and ruddy full of life and strength and spirits a tireless and energetic talker and always overflowing with good nature and bursting with jollity it was a choice and satisfactory menagerie this pensive poet and this gladsome gorilla 
an indelicate story was a sharp distress to Stoddard. Dolby told him twenty-five a day. Dolby always came home with us after the lecture, and entertained Stoddard till midnight. Me too. After he left I walked the floor and talked, and Stoddard went to sleep on the sofa. I hired him for company. Dolby had been agent for concerts and theatres, and Charles Dickens, and all sorts of shows and attractions for many years. He had known the human being in many aspects, and he didn't much believe in him. But the poet did. The waifs and estrays found a friend in Stoddard. Dolby tried to persuade him that he was dispensing his charities unworthily, but he was never able to succeed. One night a young American got access to Stoddard at the concert rooms and told him a moving tale. He said he was living on the Surrey side, and for some strange reason his remittances had failed to arrive from home. He had no money, he was out of employment and friendless, his girl-wife and his new baby were actually suffering for food. For the love of heaven could he lend him a sovereign until his remittances should resume. Stoddard was deeply touched and gave him a sovereign on my account. Dolby scoffed, but Stoddard stood his ground. Each told me his story later in the evening, and I backed Stoddard's judgment. Dolby said we were women in disguise, and not a sane kind of women either. The next week the young man came again. His wife was ill with a pleurisy. The baby had the bots, or something. I am not sure of the name of the disease. The doctor and the drugs had eaten up the money. The poor little family was starving. If Stoddard, in the kindness of his heart, could only spare him another sovereign, etc., etc., Stoddard was much moved, and spared him a sovereign for me. Dolby was outraged. He spoke up and said to the customer, "'Now, young man, you are going to the hotel with us, and state your case to the other member of the family. If you don't make him believe in you, I shan't honor this poet's drafts in your interest any longer, for I don't believe in you myself.' The young man was quite willing. I found no fault in him. On the contrary, I believed in him at once, and was solicitous to heal the wounds inflicted by Dolby's too frank incredulity. Therefore I did everything I could think of to cheer him up and entertain him and make him feel at home and comfortable. I spun many yarns, among others, the tale of Jim Wolfe and the cats. Learning that he had done something in a small way in literature, I offered to try to find a market for him in that line. His face lighted joyfully at that and he said that if I could only sell a small manuscript to Tom Hood's annual for him, it would be the happiest event of his sad life, and he would hold me in grateful remembrance always. That was a most pleasant night for the three of us, but Dolby was disgusted and sarcastic. Next week the baby died. Meantime I had spoken to Tom Hood and gained his sympathy. The young man had sent his manuscript to him, and the very day the child died the money for the manuscript came, three guineas. The young man came with a poor little strip of crepe around his arm, and thanked me, and said that nothing could have been more timely than that money, and that his poor little wife was grateful beyond words for the service I had rendered. He wept, and in fact Stoddard and I wept with him, which was but natural. Also Dolby wept. At least he wiped his eyes, and wrung out his handkerchief, and sobbed stertorously, and made other exaggerated shows of grief. Stoddard and I were ashamed of Dolby, and tried to make the young man understand that he meant no harm. It was only his way. The young man said sadly that he was not minding it. His grief was too deep for other hurts, that he was only thinking of the funeral, and the heavy expenses, which we cut that short and told him not to trouble about it. Leave it all to us. Send the bills to Mr. Dolby, and—' "'Yes,' said Dolby, with a mock tremor in his voice, "'send them to me, and I will pay them. What, are you going? You must not go alone in your worn and broken condition. Mr. Stoddard and I will go with you. Come, Stoddard, we will comfort the bereaved mamma and get a lock of the baby's hair.' It was shocking. We were ashamed of him again, and said so. But he was not disturbed. He said, Oh, I know this kind. The woods are full of them. I'll make this offer. If he will show me his family, I will give him twenty pounds. Come. The young man said he would not remain to be insulted, and he said good night and took his hat. But Dolby said he would go with him, and stay by him until he found the family. Stoddard went along to soothe the young man and modify Dolby. They drove across the river and all over Southwark, but did not find the family. 
At last the young man confessed there wasn't any. The thing he sold to Tom Hood's annual was Jim and the Cats, and he did not put my name to it. So that small tale was sold three times. I am selling it again, now. It is one of the best properties I have come across. Mark Twain. To be continued.